Okay, so welcome everybody. We're now in our second episode, and I'm here with Carl. And uh, the 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 particular video cast, the podcast, is not entirely about his book. It's uh, uh, about a whole bunch of things. And we're going to start off our conversation about. Um, I think the idea is what's the effectiveness of an hour long conversation, right? So we started off. We did a nice hour long, long form conversation, and uh, probably like a lot of folks out there. Uh, we're trying to really um, measure the effectiveness of something like this, right? And um, so, the, so the idea here is is that I, I think in framing it's important. Here, we, here's I'll tell you what my kind of perspective is on it. Um, we have a chance to I think slowly build something, right? With the idea that um, you know trying to accelerate it is very difficult in a world where uh, paid advertising seems to dominate these kinds of platforms. Now, there's not saying that organic can't make its way up, but within and under the umbrella of organic, I would imagine that there's some really decent messages, right? And then there's a whole lot of cat videos, right? <laughs> Yeah. Right. So we have to. So what my one of my foundational principles here was to say, I absolutely don't have a crystal ball. Right. And so my my recommendation to uh, I could call them clients or planks at members or, you know, fellow co-creators and, and and thought leaders is to say the main purpose of this is to have a, a genuine conversation with people. And try and really show that side of the author, which is Carl and other people who I have interviews with, um, to have that sort of long form discussion, allow them to get to know uh, who's the person on the other side. Now, I have a few ideas, but I think it's good for me to come up to for air and give, you know, uh, the superstar of the show the ability to, you know, to voice in, right? Because it's difficult to get you know, to get the, to penetrate the minds of readers and get and build audience, right? Yeah, you know, the, it's been an interesting two weeks for me uh, in terms of, uh, I, I I have an Android phone and, and I was able to act on an invite from a, a friend who's into social network, his name is Bobby Fishkin. He had given me a um, an invite to Clubhouse. And, and so about two weeks ago, they released an Android type support. And I've been playing around with that. Um, it's, you know what it is, right? It's, uh, it, it's basically conversation, but it's just voice. Um, and I was a little skeptical just based on the description about how alluring uh, it could be. But just, you know, r right away, I could see it was, was a good way to to have a conversation, a multi-participant uh, conversation. Um, there's a guy that I connected with uh, on on Clubhouse from the U who, who sent me a, a link for something that's very similar to Plank Planksip, and I suggested to him that you two should should connect. And then there's another uh, one that I came across. Which is more video oriented, I think. It's in the UK called Mighty Networks. Hmm. And what I'm sensing overall is that there's this ex experimentation taking place on how to connect uh, people who are interested in talking about or learning about interesting social, economic, philosophical stuff. Um, but so there's the, these these people. People like yourself who who put enough oomph into it to actually you know create a, a, a platform and and do all the work that behind the scenes in front of a camera whatnot it's like these little sprouts you know growing around the globe uh, and and there's people responding to it mm. but what's the winning formula how do you deal with attention spans how do you do is is it video or just audio is it written uh is is it tweets um it's it's an interesting period of time where you could see almost like two ends of the dendrites <laughs> trying to connect um 
but uncertain as to what approach is going to be the most popular. Yeah, how much does the potential for myelination come into the picture with that analogy, right? Like, how do we reinforce the message prior to it even forming the node? You know, we might we might have all the precursors for forming the node, but you know, do we have a a scalability plan? Essentially, that could be way one way to look at it, right? Yeah, scale traction and scalability, um, and and then I guess the 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 question will be how durable. Is it because there's always going to be something else coming up, some new way of trying to, to tap into that desire? Um, there's going to be a winner or several winners um, that come through, but but that energy that you and others are sensing is there. Yeah. Well, I will tell you that my wholehearted. Um, uh, desire, I guess, right, would be that we we have information structures, right? Even if we, you know, we use the and and the the biological information structures, if we want to use the analogy of the brain, that we have room uh, at some point in that picture of the dendrite, right, for um, a bilateral uh, conversation and sharing of ideas. What's I what's ideas? Let me clarify, because as a philosopher, this is the kind of thing where it could just you know throw somebody off the track, right? But even if you look at at Plato's lowest rung of knowledge, he talks about conjecture, right? And so this is just you know the babble that goes back and forth, right? And we could say <laughs> let's put, let's relate it to the babble, right? Huh. The issue is, is that I still hold on to something that something can emerge epiphenomenally from that babble. And that if we focus too much on the system, that no wonder an academic community says, this is a gimmick. And so at what point do we stand up as individuals and, and scream for that, essentially, like intellectually say, guys, this is the value. These are the bridges that we need to form. Planksip as a community, its intention is to build that gap between layman and philosopher, academic, and layman again, right? These kinds of things. You know, one, one it's like this, this experiment has expanded a, a new vector for how people come together. It's not tied to geography um, or physical proximity or shared workplace, it's more of, of grazing on ideas and maybe the technology that one wants to interface with, but man, there, there is something palpable there. And um, you, you, you know, we're, we're looking at it as a, a positive thing because we're talking about positive things in, in societal enriching, Thing. But you, is, you think about it like anything has a dark potential too, and and so there could be communities of interest that uh, are negative and 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 bad things that normally would be suppressed in a physical community because people felt shunned or or you know there wasn't that echo chamber form. But then you see. Primarily in in the political realm right now, this uh, amplification of weird stuff, <laughs> and and yeah, I I think that overall we're, we're we we've been several decades into some economic um, I don't know, decline, but a rise in uncertainty and anxiety and. As we become more anxious, we, we're more likely to believe things about others that may be true or just maybe kind of wacky. Uh, so it's almost as if we're a little jar of bees, you know, that, that we're getting shaken a bit and we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're agitating, we're looking, we're seeking out. Some of us going to the light side, some to the dark side, and we're doing it in different ways. 
Yeah, good point. I mean, uh, I no, I, I like that. I'm totally following you. I'm wanting you to keep continuing, right? Because, <laughs> you, know, you know, just start at light and darkness. That's like kind of the, you know, the, the cosmology of the Bible, right? So it sounds like you're just opening in the first few pages. So it's like, come on, tell me what, at least get to the, at least get to the beginning about, you know, people, you know, who beget who? <laughs> yeah, we need a deep, like, deep narrator yeah. voice and, you know, <laughs> it, it came from beneath the sea. <laughs> it, it, it's underneath your bed. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's going to get you while you sleep. But like, here's the good stuff. It, yeah, it, yeah. It's it's Pandora's box. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Okay, I do have a question for you. I'm going to give you an option between two questions because one's related to your book and then the second one is not related to your book. So I'm going to ask both questions in what order would you like them? The book related first or not first? Whatever comes to mind. Okay, let's do the book related one first. So you okay. can't jump on the answer until you hear the second question. Okay. Oh, okay. All right, because I'm going to ask you two questions, and you can pick which one you want to answer. And you can okay. answer them both, but it'll be into you know just I'll ask you two questions. Okay. So the, so the first question is about your book, and um, I knew that my homework for your book was to uh, was to look at the 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 one chapter about the uh, cryptocurrency. Mm. Okay. But I couldn't, it was too tantalizing because the prior book, or the prior chapter to that is on game theory. So mm -hmm. I was like, ah, screw it. I'm going to go right in here and I'm going to start reading about game theory, right? So my question would be like, let's talk, let's spend some time talking about game theory. It's not even a question. It's like, I just want to talk about it, right? For, you know. Now, the other question actually has to do with how you classify economics. And I think that if you... Number one, I would say like the four main categories of economics would be like a biological, a uh, Austrian, uh, you know, post-Keynesian and a neoclassical. OK, that that's kind of how I'm picturing it. So I'm wondering if that's how you picture it. Um, am I missing anything? What kind of traditions do you for people watching? Do you think you fall under? Is it even a point of differentiation? Um, I have my assumptions, but that that would be the question, not directly related to your book, maybe meta related to your book. I view myself as a practical optimist, um, a tactical optimist, but in the long term, sort of a uh, pessimist. <laughs> and that's not really a school of economic thought. Um, I, I, Oftentimes in economics or many other things, one observes ma macro level behavior and then tries to drill down to find an explanation. Why is this happening? When I, the, uh, the development of a fair share model wasn't about that per se. It was, we, we really started, my, my partner and I who passed away, uh, a, a, about two years ago, um, was really at the microeconomic structure, how to structure a deal so it might be appealing to people. Um, there was a lot of work taking, take, there was something beguiling about it. Uh, for, for me, when we first began talking, in, in many respects, I saw it as a uh, lo looking at some clouds up in the sky and, and, and a, and a um, bridge being spanning two of, two, two of the clouds. Going, wow, that's really cool. How do, you, how do you get there? And it was more of a process of trying to figure out some of that detail. How would you make something work there? But then also, how would you explain it to somebody? In the process of explaining and trying to identify relevance, um, I would look to analogies. And so it, it was like the, we had this thing, and then we we're trying to, to express meaning as opposed to look starting with what's the meaning of something and then kind of drilling down and, and looking for some specifics. And I think a lot of social movements basically start off at that uh, high high end, how to make the world more just, how to 
um, uh, create opportunity, how, how to do, do things. Um, you know, you could talk about how the genders get together or, or relate to one another or, or different races um, and start off with this high theory as opposed to how should people talk, how should people engage with each other at, a, at an individual level. So um, I, I didn't think of myself in or this whole process as a economic camp. Um, even the word fair, fairness, you know, it, it's sort of built uh, momentum as to how, why, why that word was, you know, why, why we incorporated fair share in. It was more initially like, oh, that's a good name. We could use that. Um, but then in, in sort of polishing the idea and trying to figure out how to convey it, and how it fit into the um, the whole spectrum of possibilities began to see well it is a fair and why is it fair because um, we're adapting an idea that has worked demonstrated itself to work very well for private investors who are accredited investors and apply it to the IPO market where anyone can invest. I mean, if it works, if it works in the private market, why shouldn't it apply in the public market? That would be fair. Uh, another aspect of fair, fairness is um, how do you figure out how to balance the interest of investors and employees, which includes founders? What's the value of an idea? No one really knows. Uh, you can't measure it reliably, but with a conventional approach, there's a value being placed on future performance at the time of the equity investment. Uh, so, you know, if I, I said, Daniel, I have an idea and I need some money. Yeah, yeah. And um, I said, well, how much do you need, Carl? I said, I need a dollar. And then, and you say, well, what do I get for the dollar? And I'll say, I'll give you half the company. Mm. You can add zeros to make it more realistic. Yeah. But, but in essence, if, if you invest on those terms, turns out we're agreeing that my idea is worth a dollar, right? Because your dollar is worth a dollar. And you'll break even if somebody buys the company for two bucks. Right? So... The the question here is is my idea really Wait, worth sorry, why, why would I break even if I, if somebody gave me two dollars? No, no, someone bought the company for two dollars. Yeah, so I I have an idea. You have some money. Oh, we go 50-50. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, give you yeah. we got half, and and you know if Sarah across the street buys the company for two bucks, you break even. <laughs> you know, so yeah, that's the, that's the idea. Actually, it's like the audience was with you. They were all waiting for me to catch up. <laughs> uh, well, right? They just saw that. I, I don't know. It, that was like, we were right. They were, I'm sure they were ahead of me, right? <laughs> well, valuation is an obscure term. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I want to pause for a minute. I want to tell you something a little bit more like platonic here, okay? Because okay. kind of the philosopher that I am. And I want to just test your imagination and everything, right? So um, I do fundamentally, it's like I, I have an aversion to this idea that the, the idea of a, an idea is worth nothing, right? We know essentially it's not worth nothing, that it is actually worth something, right? The idea is worth something, right? It's, so you say, well, I, I, I easily could see how you would go and say, well, it's not worth something until you actually make something material out of it, right? But a fact is that without the idea substrate, we wouldn't have any material things. This is to me, this is how I can distill down Plato, right? Is that mm -hmm. where does this come from? It comes from, there's a revealing of sorts that comes to us that we, you know, we come up with these ideas and make them into some sort of a material thing. So if I, if I say that it's worthless, essentially I could follow the logic that I could remove it, right? And then it wouldn't be required anymore, right? And, and I think 
there's your devastating blow. You obviously need ideas in order to, you know, to bring things to the market, right? So, 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 you, so you, before you ask that question, you're, you're, you're provoking two thoughts. Um, one is every entrepreneur thinks their idea is worth a lot, right? Right. And anyone who's willing to invest thinks it is too and they and and both of them think if they like it other people will like it too there is that my baby you know I'm, yeah yeah and 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 there's some pride and and thoughts take some work if at least to be cogent <laughs> <laughs> um but but there's uh, a guy i quote in the first of the four chapters on valuation uh that sort of set an alternative perspective mm. His name is uh, Derek Sivers, and he's uh, an entrepreneur. He says he's I'm I'm a musician, programmer, writer, entrepreneur, and student, though not in that order. I'm fascinated with the usable psychology of self improvement, communication, business philosophy, and cross cultural relativism. I love seeing a different point of view. So that's how he introduces himself. But he, he had a blog post that I included in the book. And the to- title is, Ideas Are Just a Multiplier of Execution. Mm-hmm. And he said, to me, ideas are worth nothing unless executed. They are just a multiplier. Execution is worth millions. So he has two columns. One is headed up called The Value of an Idea. And he's got the first entry is an awful idea worth negative one. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Weak idea is worth one. So-so idea is worth five. Uh, Good idea is worth 10. Great idea is worth 15. Brilliant idea is worth 20. Okay, that ranking. Then the other column is called the value of execution. So no execution is worth a dollar. Weak execution is $1,000, so-so execution, $10,000, um, good execution, $100,000, great execution, a million, brilliant execution, $10 million. So he said... <laughs> That's an evil genius model. <laughs> yeah, so he said, Are you, no, so did you catch that? He's got great, like Alexander the Great that goes out and Hellenizes all of Western civilization. But then you've got the evil genius that's at the top that just did even better. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said, he said, to make a business, you need to multiply the two. The most brilliant idea with no execution is worth $20. Oh, I see. Yeah. The most brilliant idea takes execution to be worth $20 million. So he says, that's why I don't want to hear people's ideas. Yeah. I'm not interested until I see the execution. Uh, but, well, two, but, but he two. also, I, I get that. I think of the, the, the that show, the is it the lion's den or something like this, or the shark's tank or something? You know, this one where. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we have to put on the hats of like bank managers that are doing a valuation assessment. Okay. And as an investor, somebody that's sitting up at the top of my castle. I look down and say, yes, that's valuable. I'm going to have some of that. Yes, that's valuable. I'm going to have some of that. Okay. So you're right. If I have just an idea and I come to you and I say, Carl, I see you sitting up on your throne there. Here's my idea. You're going to say, well, it's worthless to me unless you can show me that it's actually valuable. Scales makes money, all this kind of thing, right? I get that. Then we have these duality of how to perceive ideas. that yeah, they, yeah. they enlighten our lives and 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 they give us the uh, excite our imagination, give us a sense of purpose. Um, they persuade us to do things. Um, but then, in terms of economic value, maybe we need to lean more toward execution. Right? No, no, no. I, I so what if I say I have the idea? Right? I can get to a halfway point in this conceptualization. I bring Carl into the equation. He has. Are, we have a convergence of ideas still worth zero. Together, we're able to produce something. Mm-hmm. But the problem is, is that the evaluators, you're not going to evaluator to try and bring them into to you know to 
the necessary funds for people to come together to get to that valuation. The whole funding of the pre-valuation is done by individuals, right? Well, it, it, it's consenting adults, but even though, you know, in, in that early example, I said we, we would agree that my idea is worth a dollar, right? If you invest a dollar and got half the company, but you may not really think of it that way when you're investing. You may say, oh, I like Carl. I like his idea. Um, I'm happy to get 50%, but, but if, if you walked down and talked to your friend about it, they said, well, how much, what was the pre-money valuation? Michael, what? <laughs> no, there was, uh, yeah, no, I and really, that mean? But, if you're, if you're, but if you're talking to the group of the entrepreneurs, there's two ways to look at that. You can look at the group of entrepreneurs and say, yeah, your ideas are your ideas are not worth nothing until you actually have equity in something, right? I understand the bank perspective. I really understand that. But um, what was the value of Albert Einstein's idea while he was working? This is the perfect example. While he was working in the um, in, in the patent office, it was worth nothing according to that model, right? Now, so then if we were to say right now that we could just erase Albert Einstein completely from history, then we could say, what was at stake with that? How much was that value? How much was that knowledge worth? It brings up both points. It says the value is in the execution, number one, but there's also ones that don't get executed. How much do we lose? Well, the thing is, is if we know about it, if I know about something that I'm very confident can scale really nicely, but I can't convince Carl and I can't convince, you know, Patty down the street, I can be just like the Planksip namesake, which is Max Planck, who says, you know what? It, it's it, paradigm shifts take generations people the new guard has to come in and only when you know the death of the people in charge do you really get to see new ideas happen unless you get into some sort of rousseauian or marxist revolution right now that's on the most radical ideas but if you know there's i'm just saying that there's other ideas that never see the light of day that potentially could be really good we just don't have that reliable means of mechanism of either fostering up them to to a point where that we can actually see measurable results, right? Or, right, because I'm saying some ideas you just need capital for, right? You just need capital to demonstrate it. Like, show me a use case. Give me, you know, empirical data. I'm like, give me some money and I'll do that. Oh, perfect. Here you go. So this is the whole concept of research and development, though, Carl, right? Yeah, well, it, it also just shows the... the elasticity uh, and, and, and slipperiness of the word value. You know, let, let, let's say we had a, um, yeah. a, a, a comedy routine at a club and, <laughs> and um, um, two, two other guys had, had one um, that came on after ours and everybody came, came, uh, came, no one watched ours, but they all came and, and, and watched the other guys. Okay. Both are forms of entertainment. Mm. Substantively, they're, they're really both two guys on a stage trying to be funny. But ours is not getting any people to, to come in or, or buy drinks or whatever. The, however, the value is being assessed, buy tickets. Um, and the other ones are. So, I don't know, what, what's the value of entertainment is the question. Well, it depends on how many, how many people are yeah. buying tickets. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. And I, and I think that there's a level of practicality that we, you know, and this kind of brings us back to our first point about, you know, the number of eyeballs on the particular video. And so I'm actually, we should maybe pause there and, and, and spend some time talking about that, even elaborating on it a little bit further. So the idea is, is you want to go into game theory first? Uh, up to you. Still, do you want to do game theory and then come back to this? So what was it? What was it? Uh, I remember you said game theory was part of your question, but um, I just wanted to spend some time talking about game theory and how you applied it in your book. Oh, well. Game theory 
uh, sort of is a what if type of thing. You, you take take apart a complex system and you start to play with components. And in the process, you can see the role potentially that the piece that you removed or you added is affecting um, possible outcomes. Economics is largely about incentives. Um, and oftentimes when we have systems that uh, seem to go out of whack, if you look at the incentive, you can see, oh, I can see why it went out of whack. You can apply that to politics, uh, organizational structures, um, uh, relationships. So it seemed like a fun way to dissect um, the whole subject of capital markets and valuation. So that that's how, how I got into it. Um, I think that's the chapter where, for example, I talk about stock options a little bit more in depth. And um, so so stock options is a, in a, an agreement that a company a company will award the right to an employee to buy the stock in the future at a pre usually the the price at the time. And and so they work when employees think that the stock is going to be higher in the future. So right. the sweet spot is um, when a company's private, because the employees all think, well, we're going to get acquired or we're going to go public. It's a very reasonable uh, uh, aspiration or expectation to have. Um, so. Of course, employees say, hey, I'd like to be able to lock in today's price so that in three, three, five years, I can, I can, the stock's going to be higher and I'll get the price that it's uh, worth today. Whereas, so there's a relationship there between work and reward. It's sort of um, um, not exactly direct. You know, uh, mo stock options can vest which is earning the right to exercise that option um, based on, on performance or tasks. But for the most part, uh, I, I'd say probably 95% of stock options best based on time of employment because mm -hmm. it's sort of a, a, a proxy for, for work. The assumption is if, you, um, if, if you're employed that long, by the company, you're doing work. You're doing valuable work. Um, and the reward is the ability to get yesterday's price today. When a company's public, this relationship between work and reward starts to weaken. Um, and the primary problem is that when a company's public, its valuation is being set by public investors and valuation savvy investors and valuation unsavvy investors are all having a vote. It's at that marginal price. You know, we, we saw um, in the last month or so, uh, a, a big story was developing about a company called GameStock, Game, Game Shop GameStock, I guess it is. Uh, it was a retailer brick and mortar retailer of electronic games. And the price was being bid up dramatically in the public market, public company, um, by people who, who wanted to stick it to, uh, to institutions, to, to short sellers, people who were, who were making a bet that the stock was gonna go down because the future wasn't in brick and mortar stores. And, so the, there was this valuation, the, the worth, the value of the company is measured by the stock price was you know, ballooning tremendously. Um, not because people thought it was gonna be worth that, but because it appealed to the, the emotions of these, uh, of in, some public investors who 
Maybe they thought it was going to actually go up. Maybe they thought they were sticking it to this these uh, investment funds that were making a bet that it was going to go down. Maybe they were buying it and bidding up because they thought everybody else was going to be getting on that bandwagon too. So it's a little crazy world. Yeah, yeah the, the, these um, relationships that are in response to other relationships are fiction on top of fiction, which are hard to, you know, that's why I think you know some sort of virtue economics actually come into play, but um, that would be a really contentious issue as well. Um, I just think, uh, I, I have heard about that actually. Um, and it, it seems to me it, it's it's like the call out culture and the community of woke decide to go and you know get an e trade account or yeah uh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah yeah that that was it so so that that's just <laughs> one example of of stories that get played out all the time so but at a system level um, when you're in that environment a new employee who gets the stock option. Um, not going to necessarily think the stock's going to go up. They may be thinking when they join, it's going to take an act of God to stay where it is, let alone go up. So, so the effectiveness of stock options as an incentive for employees to do their best work begins to weaken. So that's an example of you know, looking at capital structures from a game theory standpoint. You, you kind of focus on employee motivation and, and you and you consider if, if, you, if you moved it from the private space to the public space with the kind of capital structure that's typically used um, how how it may behave and and I contrasted it then with the performance stock which is operationally targeted at all uh, in focus does um, it should have the same appeal to somebody joining the company, even though the company's public and the stock is up there, um, as to a private company. Yeah. If the company's private, so in 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 a big issue, employee motivation, instead of an align an aligning of of interest, that's where game theory sort of. Um, shed some light on something. The, the other, another one that I re remember in that book was a uh, chapter is um, short selling. Yeah. So uh, that was what was relevant with the game, GameStop stock. Um, you know, the stock was at 10 and the, the professional investors thought it was probably going to be worth five. So they went through some short selling um, transactions to make money if the stock actually went down to, to five. But, you know, the people who didn't like the short sellers made the stock go up to 30 or so. <laughs> so it, it made the, these professional investors lose a lot of money. Yeah. Um, this wasn't about the value of game stock. No. <laughs> this was about other things. And um, the point I make about short selling is it's very unlikely to happen in the, in the fair share model because investors know the, 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 there's no float, there's no shares out there for that future performance. You're not going to be having a situation where um, the market says, mm. oh, we're overvaluing future performance or real, real work. Well, um, Shares for that type of performance, for for, for projected performance, their voting shares are not they're not tradable shares. They have no 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 worth. And if that performance is actually issued, there's going to be more shares that's being issued. It's, it's a complex topic, but game theory is that. But but it does offer a window to try to dissect something complex and get some insight into the overall system. I guess that's the point. Okay, all right. So let me let me say if I can do something like this. We, uh, you know, Dan and Carl decide to start a new business called the fair share business model, right? <laughs> right, this is what it is. Obviously it's a direct relationship to 
you know, selling the product, which is your book. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we've got a great idea. You spend a lot of time and research putting the book together, right? And so we've got something tangible of value, right? So we go to somebody and we say to them, hey, we've got a book. Now, um, will you give us some money in order to build this business and then you know, we can continually uh, get sales, right? Mm -hmm. So let's go through the first sort of steps with that. You and I are partners. So what kind of money do we require to get and make this our... I mean, I'm not even saying full-time effort, but let's say it was a full-time effort. I go to a group of investors and I say, look, you guys got to understand, I'm going to be working 10 hours a day, uh, six days a week on this. And so is Carl. So when we say, what is this worth? I know that that's not worth a whole lot to an investor. But what I'm coming to the table is and say, well, even as a basic human being, using uh, an average income, um, like, uh, you know, like an average income index, I think in Canada, it's like 56,000 and in the US, it's 60,000 average index, right? So this would be really great to understand, you know, what, what, what the cost is, you know, for the average person, even. I'm not saying, you know, you and I are people that fall into the minimum wage category, but, you know, as a bare sort of minimum, it's like, you know, the investment that we're putting in at least has a value to us, right? In terms of lost, at least as that, as much as that, as the average minimum wage. So if you say $60,000, that's $5,000 a month for you and $5,000 a month for me. And, uh, you know, what do we do? Well, we ask for a year at a time. Okay. So right out of the gate, just for us to make content, right? Blog articles, do all the kinds of stuff that we need to do, even if we're doing it as authentically as the value in that book. We say, well, the value is $120,000 a year just for us to be employed in that army. So, you know, what, so what's the incentive for the investor to support such an effort? I know, and, you're, and this is really an exercise on, on rhetoric, but what happens is that you and I have to come back to the table and say, yes, there's an ongoing cost or value to, you know, of, of you know, $120,000 a year. Between the two of us, what's our next move in order to provide some surplus, right? It's all about surplus. Yeah. How um, do we provide surplus? Yeah. But we yeah. have been able to pay for us, let alone build in a model for surplus. Mm -hmm. if, if the motivation of the financial backers were philosophical, philanthropic, um, the, 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 the work, the payoff would be simply putting the word out, you know, publicizing the concept. But if their motivation was more economic, um, the 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 work would result in finding companies uh, that wanted to go public using the fair share model and facilitating that you know through pulling together resources that can help a company do that and then maybe promote awareness of um, the IPO once it's available and 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 the the securing perhaps a position in that stock uh, which would have a payoff which would go to the uh, you know create the surplus as you as, as, as you're putting it and make the company more valuable because we would be having this intellectual property about uh, and how how to help companies implement this model. For their business and how they how they did it would you know there'd be variation based on the industry you know manufacturing is going to be different from food business and software is going to be different from a service it'd be different based on the stage of development you know if the company had been around for a while uh, with revenue uh, and and profit the with revenue and no profit or pre revenue or even um, you know, there's something that has 
I wrote about in the book that five years or so ago was hardly uh, known. Special Act, Special Purpose Access Corporation, Acquisition Corporation, the SPACs, S-P-A-C. Um, there's been a lot of them in the last year, and they're public offerings to basically raise a venture capital fund. Um, and, and they've been wildly popular with investors and are also popular with um, uh, the people who are forming them because it, it, there's, they can get better fee. They can make more money faster than they can by starting a venture cap, private venture capital fund. So what are these then? They're like a co-op kind of venture capital thing? Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's called a special purpose acquisition corporation hmm. known by SPAC as the acronym or SPAC. Um, the, it, the structure has been around since the 1930s. And it's um, the idea is that, well, I, I think I told you in, in our last session, um, I had talked to a former SEC uh, examiner about um, uh, w w what kind of company can go public. Yeah. And um, because some people in the room were, who, who was in the room were sort of inferring that, oh, you had to be profitable. Oh, you had to be a certain size or something before you could go have an IPO. And I asked him to clarify what stage of development it had to be. And his answer was, you can sell stock in a dead horse as long as you disclose that it's a dead horse. Right. Um, a SPAC has no business. It doesn't even know what the business, it, it wants to raise money in a public offering. Um, to acquire other companies. It, it, when, it, when it's raising that money, let's say it's $100 million, they can't, they, they, they say, and they, they can't know who they want to acquire. It's as if they're saying, okay, give me some money because I'm gonna go acquire a bunch of companies and they're gonna be worth a lot more afterwards. But I don't know who it is. <laughs> I, if, I, if I had an idea as to who it would be, I'd have to disclose something about that uh, company because it was an intention of mine. So by design, one's going public for a business before you even know what the business is, who it is, where it's located, anything. So SPACs show a, um, a desire, a hunger on the part of public investors to participate in a managed venture fund. Mm. Yeah, that, that, uh, how long the SPAC fever lasts is, is question, uh, questionable, but it is sort of funny from a valuation standpoint. Let's say um, I have a SPAC and I raise $100 million in a public offering. And my intention is to go acquire private companies that I think are a good acquisition. I would pay not in uh, maybe some cash, but I'd also in, in the transaction um, that company would become public because I they're now part of me, and I would issue some of my shares out to my shareholders as like a dividend. And now they have shares in this public company that I acquired. It's like I shut it, shut it off. Um, but you, you think about a valuation question. Um, before the IPO, I mean, I have no earnings. I have no assets. I have nothing other than an idea <laughs> and, and ambition. The I, pe People like the idea. They give me $100 million, the IPO closes. All I have is $100 million in the bank. I have no business. I have no idea. I have nothing. What's the value of my SPAC? 
my bet is that you'd see that the public valuation might be, would exceed the value of the cash, the hundred million dollars. It might be worth one hundred and twenty million in in the market. Why? Because people are who are voting, they're not valuation savvy, but they're also putting a value on my idea. You know, right. Carl has a hundred million dollars now. What can he do with that? And it's probably going to be worth two hundred million. So let's bid it up. Um, so it's it's interesting how this discussion is sort of bridged to um, the earlier one about valuation. What's the value of an idea? Well, uh, you, you, from a rational standpoint, um, you say, hey, this SPAC is only worth the money that it has. <laughs> um, you know, if it actually acquires a company, you might say, oh, that company that was acquired for 25 million really is going to be worth 40 million and, and, and bid the price up that way. There's some rationality there. But just when I have the money and just the idea as to how I'm going to deploy it, that, that's a little house of mirrors. If you will. No, I, I get it. So let's let's put the thing because we talked about you know trying to fit Planksip into the model, the fair share model, right? And I, I said uh, we were not quite there as a small you know publishing entity and and media outlet, but we're but I'm I'm trying to make the steps, you know, I'm trying to weave out the journey to to actually get there, right? And um, I don't know if it's possible because we have a membership cooperative, and the the idea was that we're not trying to build a business that's attractive to um, like an outside investor. That's not, I mean, but then you say, is that even something that's scalable? Yes, but not through that kind of market mechanism, I would, I would, I would say. So yeah, I don't know. I, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, question on Clubhouse. Um, the program or, or the application I told you about. Right. right. Uh, um, you, it's, it, it's just based on phones. So it's audio only, but you can see other people in the room. There's no advertising. There's no fee. They're not making money uh, from from the users, as as far as I can tell, unless there's some data that they're you know able to to resell and target for ads or something. But it's growing, and 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 so it's a phenomenon. But there's also an investment in infrastructure that they need to make in terms of server farms and. Uh, you know, paying uh, programmers to to develop develop new features and capabilities. Well, what's that worth? What what's the, what what's the the valuation question? Um, it's probably going to be considered worth a lot because they're the they're they're developing a new platform and it's popular. And and people think, well, we'll see what it's going to be worth. You know, YouTube before it was acquired by Google, um, you would have thought was a um, sponge for cash because they had to build off this network uh, and maintain it for delivering video content, and there wasn't really much of uh, in the way of ads. Um, Google acquired it for you know a fair amount of money. I think about 190 million or so um, years ago. But there are things that we do, things that 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 um, we assign value to, where it's not obvious exactly why it is that it's, um, it it seems the value seems to basically flow from what do we think somebody else will pay for it down the road. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get that. I was just trying to think of what the, I knew I did this a calculation before on the, the IPO value of Facebook, which I see the Google Oracle tells me it was $38 as of May 18th, 2012. It fell to 1773. But I think I remember doing something and saying the total number of outstanding shares, the value of the stock means the total value of the whole company was worth something. I don't know if this makes sense. But it was something like $30 or $28.32. I think that's the number that comes to my mind. It might be way off, but per person. 
So they had so many outstanding shares and a valuation on a share price of X. And if you multiply that by the number of outstanding shares and then divided it by the number of people on the planet, it worked out to like $32 (laughs) or $28.32 or something like this, right? And I was like, this is a really interesting, you know, statement on our behalf to say that we as a species are valuing, um, and if we put this in real human terms, right, that you have something from like the UN that says that it's $2 a day for somebody to eat, right, as a minimum threshold. And so we put a valuation on something fictional like Facebook, right, had no revenue model whatsoever, just the idea that there's a lot of people looking at this, so it's worth some sort of form of future manipulation or something. Uh, Manipulation, maybe I'm reaching, right? But there's something that's going to be value for um, benefit to people, you know, this sort of thing, right? But if I say that there's 8.9 billion people on the planet and several billion of those people live below a, a poverty threshold, the value for that for me is, according to the market, worth zero because there's no way to earn a return on that. And so that the, the point that I'm trying to make is that, and it's not really related to your book, <clears throat> we can just basically say that's the way the system is, but the value of that individual life at $2 and you know, 50 cents a person is worth nothing in terms of a, a, a market, capital market system, right? And so <clears throat> I personally think that your relegating an entire population into um, a valuation of their ideas as being non-existent. It's not, it's, it's worthless. And I think there's a fundamental issue with how we, and it made these, these conversations, Carl, just, you know, they might keep coming back to valuation. And you might say, look, and I understand, I want to warn the listeners and the, you know, the, the potential buyers for the book that this is absolutely you know, not an argument that that Carl faces in the book. He's really trying to make a system better. And in that regard, it's not really the argument, right? It's not really, you're not making any of these claims in the book, right? So, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to change anybody, anyone's behavior. Right. You know, sec- the secondary market where, where, where people buy, investors buy things from other investors, um, it is what it is. I'm not trying to change people's behavior. Humankind, human behavior will be what it is. What I'm trying to do is, is uh, promote the, the idea of structuring an IPO so that um, there's incentive, powerful incentive for, for investors to invest. And if the, the company's positioned in a way where it can outcompete other companies for talent. Interesting, yeah. So that so um, let, let's if if I said um, you know if comparable companies to to mine when I'm going public public um, are considered to be worth a hundred million, but I go out with a pre money valuation of well, I use this example sometimes. Um, so let's say I have a company where I've raised two million in the private market in the last year or two. Um, things are going great, and now I want to raise twenty million. I can do it in the private market or the public market. If I go to the private market, I'm going to end up with a VC because twenty million is a lot of money, and the type of deal structure that a venture capitalist requires is a modified conventional capital structure. Um, in other words, a different class of stock from the ones that the employees have or even the other investors. And there'll be deal terms on it there that protect that venture capital firm from overpaying for a position. You know, if, if, if it turns out there's the pivot needed or the market changes or something, you know they're renting out their money basically, and they're going to want their targeted returns. If it doesn't come from a rise in the appreciation of the of of of, of the company, they're going to take it from the employees and the other investors. Mm. It's a bit, I say, like 
um, going to sleep in a room where there's a python curled in the corner. <laughs> if it's hungry, <laughs> we're all going to get squeaked. Um, That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, if if I go the public route for about twenty million. I've got a choice between a conventional capital structure and a fair share model. Assume for this example that comp companies comparable to mine are considered to be worth $100 million. You'd expect me to go because of my expected future performance is so great. You know, I've, I've got a, a, uh, a cure for diabetes or something. Um, You'd expect me to go out with a pre-money valuation, value the company before I raise the 20 million of 100 million, right? Because everybody says comparable companies are 100 million. I would raise 20 million in the IPO. Immediately after that IPO closes, my post-money valuation would be 120 million, 100 pre-money plus the 20 that I raise, right? And then it would fluctuate in the secondary market based on what going on there. If I were to raise the, the 20 million with uh, the fair share model IPO, I might go out with a pre-money valuation of 10 million, not 100. 10 would give a little pop for my $2 million private investors. So I would, um, I'd still raise 20 million. And immediately after the IPO closes, I'd have a post-money valuation of uh, 30 million. 10 plus to 20. Why would I do that? Well, because I've defined uh, as a measure of performance a rise in the market value of the company. So I'm making a bet, and the bet is that investors in the secondary market who, who buy shares from other investors, other shareholders, are going to say, hmm, this is an undervalued asset. It should be 120 million. But it's down here at 30 million. So they start to bid the price up. As that happens, some of that voting non tradable stock that the employees have converts into the tradable stock that the investors have. That's reducing the percentage ownership of the investors. But they don't care because the value of their position is going up. So the point is that mm -hmm. IPO investors <laughs> are. are Investors are usually attracted to an IPO because of the market that the company's in, the technology it's using, and who's on the team. The fair share model adds a fourth factor. It's a deal. It's like a big screen TV on Black Friday. I don't like that example. <laughs> so uh, so it, it, the presumption is that the market's the second... It, Secondary investors are going to maybe they'll even bid it up, you know, far far higher because they'll say, "Wow, this company is really confident in its ability to perform. I want to bet on them. Maybe it's worth even more." Um, but the other way the market could take it too, though, Carl, I could say that <clears throat> is is more reflective of. Um, because the, the 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 valuation is more reliable and comes in discrete incremental sort of builds and iterations, that this uh, would... I, I wouldn't say real. It it it's subject to more perspectives, more more opinions. You know, just because uh, an, an idea, uh, what what's the value of an idea? What if it's we're just in a room talking about it? And I don't know, what is that? But what if we were in a room of a thousand people and they were all applauding it? Same idea. It, 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 it appears to be worth more because more people are weighing in on it. Or maybe more people are excited about it, right? Yeah, now. yeah. So, so that, that was the point about the fair share model. It was to, to not change recognize the secondary market is what it is. But to to create a window there where there's incentive for investors to write a check to the company, that's what happens in an IPO. The, the, if, if the company is issuing new shares, there's money going to the company's coffers as opposed to just other shareholders. 
And the other thing was, you know, early stage companies face a difficult path. There's lots of things that can go wrong and will go wrong. But um, a team that is um, well equipped and, and performs well has a better chance of, of surviving than one that got difficulty. And, and so the whole idea was not only do, did I want to make it uh, more compelling for um, investors to write a check to the company, but I wanted the company to leave that process with a weapon, a tool that would allow it to outcompete other, other uh, better financed companies, frankly, and that's the performance stock. So, uh, you know, we talked earlier about stock options. Stock options can, is typically used to attract um, employees to, to a public company. Um, they could be used by a company that has the fair share model. They could issue stock options on their tradable stock, but they would also have this huge performance stock pool, which anticipates a decade worth of uh, performance. Not all of it's going to convert, probably. Right. But it, it's <laughs> issue. It, it's just like that spontaneous generation. It's that big bang moment in terms of the capital structure. Now, all of a sudden, there's this big pool that um, if, if, if the company is trying to attract an employee, I, I use this example uh, let's say I wanted to hire you and you had an offer from Apple. I'd say, Daniel, I've, I've had my IPO. I can pay you a salary. It won't be as much as Apple. The benefits won't be as nice as Apple. I can give you stock options like Apple can, but mine have more upside. But I can give you something that Apple cannot. And that's an interest in my performance stock pool. And it only has value if we as a team are delivering these results. So the historic mm -hmm. analogy to me is uh, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh and the English fleet versus the Spanish Armada. You know, uh, the ability to outmaneuver the big platforms on, on that also critical um, uh, challenge of, of motivating a, a workforce. And that, that it's very possible uh, I think it's in the game theory chapter, uh, if not somewhere else. There's creative ways that a company could use that performance stock. Um, it could use, well, you could give it some of it to its pre-IPO investors as a sweetener to support this novel way of going public uh, and, but, uh, and give some upside to them. It could go to uh, its supply chain and say, okay, we're gonna create a special form of this performance stock that's non-voting. And if we come to terms on, you know, normally uh, a company would, would mm -hmm. uh, negotiate with a supplier based on quality, price, and delivery. Right. Well, I could say if we come to terms on that, um, as an added incentive, we'll yeah. allow you to participate in this non-voting performance stock and if we do well, you do even better than yeah. you would have just on, on the sale of products. So that fostering a strong supply network. Um, would, I, would, would I be in a position to put my hand up as, I mean, I know, <clears throat> see, the thing is, is that I, I kind of feel like snake salesman. If I, if, I say, if I say to somebody like one of my suppliers to say, I'm just guessing that your margin with me is anywhere between 30 and 50 percent. And I know just just for it doesn't matter if it's 10, whatever. Right. But just say between 30 and 50 percent. So for argument's sake, let's say it's 50 percent. And so what I tell them is I say, let's crank it down to 10 and I'll give you X number of shares. And together we'll kind of partner and work yeah, together. Yeah, that would be an interesting. And, and interestingly, if you secured that deal, your performance measures on, on your profitability would be improving. because you're getting a better price from your supplier. Yeah. So you're more profitable, which makes your stock worth more, which makes it more likely that that performance stock is going to convert. And we're more, we're more competitive. So that's the whole thing. And I think, I think um, 
you know, companies do this in a way, but in a different way, they're trying to, you know, come in, they, they, they form buyers groups and, you know, preferred pricing and all sort of other mechanisms, but it's not really, it's not really a fair model for the average bloke or the small business, right? It's, it's. So I, I think the one takeaway is, is, is that um, when you asked early on about the school of economics, yeah. Um, The last century, we saw the, the, the epic challenge turned out to be um, would the commanding heights of world economies be uh, uh, controlled by markets or by central planning? Mm. I think the key economic challenge of this century is going to be can the benefits of capitalism be more fairly and broadly realized? I'm not trying to come up with an alternative. I'm trying to strengthen the effect of markets yeah. because um, that creates a vibrancy in, in the economy. Uh, it, it promotes optimism about the future, even though it's, it's a prospect where there's high failure rates, there's that sense of self-actualization uh, that um, people who are participating either as a customer, as an employee, founder, uh, or an investor in an entrepreneurial economy. There's this sense of hope uh, and vitality, which is good for an economy. Um, and as long as, it, to the extent that that optimism is broadly available, no, no matter you know, who you are, um, that would be good, not only for the economy, but good for political systems too. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so I want to bring up, uh, I want to bring up this idea of, um, you know, the the Carl and Dan show for a minute. I'm going to bring it back again to, you know, how how do we make this these messages more deliverable? Or I was even thinking. What if we just as an imagination exercise, say we did actually make the fair share model, the use and utilize the fair share model, right? And so one of the people that come to the table is blank set, and the other person that comes to the table is Carl. So our two starting points means that our analogy for earlier on is still relevant. And I so, want you to imagine just for, just for a minute though, just yeah. think that if if we make a conscious business effort that. What does that mean? But we make a conscious business effort to go and approach people <clears throat> that are potential IPOs. We have a list of people and we, we make a conscious effort to have a sales team, have a sales manager, uh, have presentations, actively pitch something. So now what we're going to say to them is say, hey, look, we'll help you with this. What do we offer? What's our business model? Do we offer uh, consulting services with um, you know, like my rate is is like fifteen thousand dollars a month, say, and say yours is as well. We say, well, we'll offer you five thousand dollars a month to consult with you on this particular thing, and the other ten thousand dollars we want to put it into the fair share model because you're about to go IPO, and we're going to be your consultant during that sort of process, right? The guy literally wrote the book on it, <laughs> right? So tell me why that wouldn't be a viable. Uh, a business model. It doesn't necessarily scale unless we have. Well, you're talking about a consulting business that we're having, or or I guess so. And you would have, well, I would say a consultancy. So we have a little bit of oversight as, like, say, the founding partners or something like this, right? And so then, what we're doing is we're bringing on people, probably like people with an economic background, to make sure that they understand. It, it doesn't seem complicated. But I think that the like the I think it requires a, a bit of constant um, reinforcement, you know, to break down some of the conventions that are already in place. And it's about timing. It's not, you know, you can hit somebody. You got to hit the right people at the right time, and then be able to say we're offering valuable expertise to take you through that process, right? So it's not like, yeah. you know, the way it is right now, Carl, is it looks like this. The guy says, oh, you got a great idea. And you go, yeah, here's my book, right? Uh, how that works. There, there's my book. But from that standpoint, why don't we put up our hands and say, and we can help you along that sort of process. We can. So, so, yeah, so, so the, 
the book imagined this is about social change. So question right. is how do you how do you ignite that? And and it was a uh, an approach I described in the book that um, I'll tell you what it is, but I'll also say that I, I'm re-examining it. So the idea was I saw it as a three-stage process in the book. First stage is to uh, create popular awareness of the fair share model. And I'd be confident that people would say, oh, I like this idea. If, if, if there was a company that was going to use it, I'd be interested in looking at it. I, I know that would happen because this happens all the time. Um, and I thought that would lead people who had expertise in different facets of the capital ecosystem, you know, from a legal, from accounting, tax, corporate governance, uh, trading exchanges, um, compensation models. The, there was all sorts of things that uh, people could help enhance best practices for define them. It'd be different for biotech versus a software company, for example. Um, and then it would be companies that tried it. I'm think, thinking now more that, okay, it's gonna probably take a while for that public awareness to develop because people don't have that much time and attention spans are, 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 are shortening. And this is a complex topic in the general um, uh, theoretical level. It's not difficult, it's just unfamiliar. Um, but it might be that the faster way to, to uh, ignite this process is to find one, two, three, half dozen companies that w are willing to try it because th they see the potential appeal. And yes, there's some trepidation about doing um, something that hasn't been done before. But there's also an upside, you know, you, you get a lot of media attention because this is a very unusual way to structure a company. And it kind of, that's why people, when they hear it, they say they like it. Well, there would be a lot of buzz about it. Maybe that would even attract more capital. It would attract employees. It would sort of do good things. And and if, if it turned out that the first few companies can, provide evidence that it helps them raise capital and it helps them attract and motivate employees, then it's sort of off to the races. So it's a chicken and egg type um, thing. I love it, Carl. I mean, the thing is that we got to think about, and I, I'm, I'm seriously, what are, what are your intuitions about doing something really that serious to say Carl could be the consultant working with Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Many companies. This, this, is, this is a lot like, you know, tailoring a shirt or something. Exactly. You, know, you got to figure out a fabric that's going to work for them. Um, and, and then you have to cut for their dimensions and make it work because it, it is a whiteboard. There's, there's, there's no one way to do it, just as if there's no one way to have a conventional capital structure or a modified capital structure. Modifications take place all the time. I, I Somewhere in the book, um, where I'm talking about social change, I, I say capital structures is the recipe for it. Mm. One part technical, two parts tradition. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you know, the when I wrote that, I, I remember sort of thinking about um, uh, Fiddler on the Roof, that opening. Yeah. yeah. How do we keep ourselves? Steady, you know, with all these things that are happening around us, you know, we're like a fiddler on the roof. Um, and they say, tradition, tradition. Well, tradition guides us in uncertainty. Um, not because it's necessarily the best way to do it, <laughs> but because it's been done before. Capital markets are no different. And, and, and so... If you want to break tradition, somebody's got to, you know, leave home, the, 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 leave the farm, leave, go for, and, and, and do something daring. But they also have to feel comfortable about their performance. They have to be able to wear this fabric that's going to be crafted 
and feel comfortable uh, for it. And I, I'll, I'll tell you, um, in terms of a regulatory perspective, um, I, I think it's, they'd be very receptive. I'll, last year, I went to a panel discussion at the Stanford Law School. It was about crowdfunding. One of the panelists was one of the five uh, sitting members of the Securities and Exchange Commission in the U.S. Right. He was a former, before that, he had been a uh, securities law professor. And I went up, showed him the book, explained the idea. He said, that's great. It, it, this is, it, it, regulators should like it. Every indication that I've had, and I've, and I've been seeking people who would be critical about it, would say, okay, this is good because it's unlikely that the investors that are being attracted to the offering are, are going to have much downside risk. Um, yeah. So, again, you know, it, it goes back to finding some entrepreneurs who um, – are dissatisfied with the options that they have for capital, who are, are confident in their ability to perform and can articulate uh, not only their business, but their the, the deal structure. We could help them with that. Okay, let's build on that because I'm willing to put some, you know, you'd, a, you'd ask for some performance, right? And I'm willing to help you with that. I really think one of our first things that we need to do um, you need to come up with an offering for consultancy, which I pretty much can just be a sounding board for. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm already a consultant with a, a data com company and the owner planks it. So this, these are kind of my credentials. Um, but essentially what we need to do is we need to get a list of the people and we need to start, I think, making presentations to them. So it, it's, it, it means scheduling, uh, you know, time slots, uh, getting an audience. Um, but it, it will be the right audience, right? It's those entrepreneurs. It's, uh, you know, so how do we get to that list? That's going to be a tough question. Yeah. And I, I, I think another quality that the early adopters will um, should have is they should have people who are going to, they must, they need to have appeal to a retail audience of investors. Okay. Um, so, uh, Something that's consumer product oriented, okay. you know, people have some exposure to, yeah. because, um, you know, it, it, if if it were, let's say, a drug discovery company that for an obscure disease, you could say, okay, we now have this great deal structure. But if they did, if people didn't know, weren't excited about the company, and interested in investing, offering them, offering a superior deal structure isn't enough. You, okay. you first have to have a desire and then you say, well, uh, well, Daniel, there's more. Good, good to know that you, 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 you like this company and, and its prospects. There's going to be an opportunity and here's how it's going to look. And, and you say it's better than what you could get anywhere else. So my, here's my thing. Okay. We're trying to do what um, business development here. OK, so one of the things for the next step that we could do is we could say, let's go and interview three um, like national level PR agencies. And so what we will do is we're not we're not suggesting one or the other. Right. We are trying to understand what the PR, PR agency is all about, um, what their effectiveness is. And I want to get some real information from them on the percentage of income from the IPO proceeds or whatever operating capital should be going actually to PR work, okay? Um, bonus information would be if there's any kinds of sectors that they do well with or perform well with, that would just help, the ma that would just help with the matchmaking business part of it, right? Yeah, and I, I think you're gonna find, I like this idea um, and, and PR is, is, is an example of, you know, there's a, in the capital ecosystem, there's people who will provide um, guidance, help, insight to entrepreneurs um, on, on different things at different points. Um, 
they all have an interest in seeing that that pathway to raising capital um, is easier for a company to, to navigate and there's just more options. Um, I, I think accelerators, and you've got some a number of them in Canada, um, yeah. would find it, the fair share model appealing because um, let, let's say it's company ABC and it's sort of an obscure thing, but it came out of the Calgary um, uh, accelerator. Uh, and p- there's an audience within Calgary for companies that are coming out of this startup uh, culture that's being created. Um, they're all potential investors, but if it, if it, it's, and that could include people from, you know, when, when you start to be a buzz in, in Calgary, it'd be in British Columbia and, 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 and in Ontario, you know, it would start, yeah. start to grow because um, this is a big deal. It's, it's, it's really rare that you find an innovation in capital markets that benefits the average investor. You certainly see it in terms of services, you know, like lower cost of transactions and stuff like that. But actual deal structures, um, not not really. And most of the innovation takes place around different ways to sell, not to structure. So Fisher Model offers something fundamental, significant, uh, and and. Uh, in terms of, of benefit to the public investors yeah. um, and to the entrepreneurs. It's new. It's unproven. Uh, it's going to take some bidding. Uh, yeah. I like the idea of the custom tailor. <laughs> yeah. But, right, man, no one, no one has come up with a reason to say, eh, that's not going to work. Yeah, I think it'll work. It's just, uh, it's, it's, it's just, convincing people to go for the uh you know to to set a structure that way that's it and i think work, young man <laughs> <laughs> well it comes it comes back you know i mean as much as i can push like th- this is the issue i think it's the you know the labor market's pushing back it's the guy at the bottom saying you yeah, know problem i can go and do that i can hire you know an entire team and build you know build this and approach people and and stuff like that, but I'm going to say, show me the money, right? So you get it from both ends. Like you're the central hub here because you're the idea guy. Then I come to you and I say, yeah, I could do that, no problem. I can go get a, you know, I can be, I can put a sales manager in place. I can, you know, go out and do X number of presentations a day, a week, a month, start building on that, and then actually, you know, do we have something to sell? Yeah, consultancy services, right? Mm-hmm. You know, with the structure to back it up. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like, realistically, you start bringing on a team over a six-month period of time. You know, you need proper training. You need all these kinds of things. You need the hurrah, hurrah guy that keeps everybody going hard on the, you know, the thing. So you're thinking, all right, like, if you really wanted to go after this, I would say two or three really good, you know, convincing, um, you know, salespeople. Uh, a good sales manager, and then, you know, have something like you and I on the advisory team. So you're, you're maybe say a total of 10 people. Well, I'm saying, you know, this, this kind of has like a, a, a fund of a fundamental, you know, cost of 50 grand a month. Yeah. I think the, um, prior to any the model, the model and was, are and everything. So it was, could easily go up to hundred grand a month. And so, so, yeah. so, so Carl, if you said to me, is like, I want to do this. I have this whole plan. I've got a million dollars in private equity and let's spend this. And, you know, we're just going to draw down through this million dollars over the next one to two years. We can set a plan in place. I'm yeah. guessing you don't have a million dollars of disposable money to sit, yeah. you know, sitting with you. It'd be like a venture comp, venture fund without necessarily much of a fund, but it's yeah. it would be, it would be ideas or implemented ideas that create the gateway uh, for a company to raise venture capital on different terms than traditionally um, is, is the case. 
and expand the number of people who have a stake in it. Yeah. Well, and then the only way that I would monetize that to actually make the fair share model part of the fair share model, right? The only way that that would possibly happen, I would think, is that as consultants, we come in and we say, excuse me, our normal rate is $5,000 or $15,000 a month. We'll do $5,000 a month and then $10,000 a month in the valuation will go towards the, uh, you, you know, the share model, right? Yeah, well, or, 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 or we could be getting performance stock. Well, know? that's what I mean, actually, performance yeah. stock. And, and some that, that, that converts uh, once the IPO closes, you know, and maybe based on some, some other milestones. So, um, yeah. But but I'd also say that we're tied to the yeah tied to the performance. So if we're talking to like an entrepreneur that has like you said a high degree of upside for PR buzz, right? But they're they're into some sort of a feel good company that's doing social good. Then and you know there's people and labor involved, and we don't want to you know strip them out of their worth, especially if they're contributing to the performance of the company. Mm -hmm. We basically that's how we structure the company. They need mm -hmm. to understand that the the owner, the entrepreneur has to say, this is how I want to structure my company. There's value in being able to defend that this is the structure of my company. My employees get more and it's, it's, it's more reliable from a valuation standpoint. It's less risky, right? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, maybe future conversations it would be um, nice to expand the type have other people involved in terms of weighing in and seeing, yeah. seeing what kind of um, potential they see, what questions they come come up with. Um, yeah. It essentially going back to the Derek Stivers uh, uh, paradigm for the value of an idea. Time to get some brilliant execution. Well, that yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, I mean, I'm not leaving it off the table of us trying to do, you know, an outreach and raise some initial capital. To me, rather than convincing more people of the idea, we already have the idea. We can present the idea to the people that can, you know, the entrepreneurs that say, yeah, I can wholeheartedly adopt that story, right? And so I, I actually don't think we're far away from being able to make a compelling, you know, presentation yeah, for yeah, immediate yeah. adoption. Yeah, I, I agree. It, it, you know, it's about probably 80% there. It's got to be some measures of, 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 of how does a company define, want to define performance? How do they propose to uh, measure it? Who should measure it? And uh, what would be the appropriate way to reward it? That's sort of the, the big things that need to be uh, fit together. Uh, then there's Tailored, some though, right, Carl? Tailored. Huh? Tailored, right? Tailored, yeah. Because yeah. these are the things that we can't give in the presentation. These are the things where the analogy comes in and the consultancy comes in is that we tailor those aspects of, of, of the message. I, I think the, the uh, contribution that some PR people would uh, provide is how, how they perceive the story and how it would be told. Because there is a story there, but, but uh, um, you know, how how do they find compelling? Do they find it? If, if, if they were jazzed, entrepreneurs might have a, would feel bolstered in their um, confidence that this could work for them. Yeah. I'll tell you, who, whoever, is, you know, the first set of cohorts that go out with this, you know, it, it could be like that GameStop, you know, the, 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 the Stock price starts to go up so much because it's sending a message that people want to support a different form of capitalism, a different way of, of, of raising venture capital, a different way of, of treating employees and, and average investors. Um, um, the uniqueness of that message is likely to be popular. And if it's popular, it could very well be expressed in a very high stock price. Right, 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 right. Uh, higher than it would be whether it was if a conventional offering had been used. Well, that's very, very interesting to me because I'm even thinking that um, part of the selection process for uh, for staff would be to negotiate their, especially if we have more remote workers, 
is to, well, you, you know, the way this works in sales too, right? It's like, you know, we go and hire people and the on target earnings, the normal sort of thing would be, you know, $6,000 a month salary and something on target earnings and blah, 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 blah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, if the starting salary was much less at, you know, say a thousand dollars a month or $250 a week, then we're seeing that those funds are actually going into the, uh, in, into, into performance stock. Like you, they literally have to understand that this is a, a trade-off, mm -hmm. right? And if they, if they do, you know, want to sign up, uh, you know, you, I guess you just got to find that balance, but you know, you have an immediate value to the, um, because you basically find somebody that is qualified has in the market for six figure income is saying, no, I'd actually rather work, you know, for, uh, you know, a fraction of that with the potential that this is going up, right? Mm -hmm. And that's part of the declaration statement, you know, to mm -hmm. the, you know, to the hire and the HR team, right? That's, that's one immediate thing, but then also in the upside is also, you know, the conversions. And so yeah, I, I think those? another important component of this, um, uh, at least as important as the, um, the PR input uh, would be, um, some securities attorneys. Now, there's one actually that I, uh, w when we're done, I'll, I'll, I may have connected you with her. She's a yeah. rich Columbia uh, securities attorney. Yeah. Um, I, th I think she would be a, a good reference point to, to begin because she, she, she understands very well um, Canadian uh, securities law. Um, and in an US, um, because they're similar, but from a practicality standpoint, um, right. that, you know, there's some tax questions, there's some other type of structuring, that, that's probably more important than the PR part. I, I, I know that this is an idea that appeals to people. Yeah. Um, that, that you, there was that portion of the book, um, where I open it up, um, and I, I describe how a few months into starting to write the book, I was taking a nap, um, and and I had a phone call, and the guy was he asked, "Well, whatever happened to Fisher?" And it turned out he was uh, a member; he had bought a membership uh, in. 98 or something like that, uh, 97. And in those days, the internet was still developing and, and new for people. And even though I was putting material up on, on the website, there was a lot of it. And and some people were finding it a little confusing or to, to, to navigate different pages and put things together. And, and, and we had some people who said, can you just print it out? <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, and so we created some binders for about 100 people or so, um, where we basically printed out the website. So it was, you know, binder about a half inch uh, thick, thick or so. Um, and so it laid out the idea, the vision, and um, we sent it to the, the members that decided to be a paid member. Well, this guy said he still had his. It was on his bookshelf and he looked at it every so often. Yeah. And I explained to him that Fair Share had gone under um, and that I was working on a book. And, and he said, well, I always thought it was a good idea. <laughs> it, it resonates with people. Yeah. So getting... Figuring out how to how to cut that cloth and and fit it, I, I think that's that's the direct line. Agreed. And, and then and you know, securities attorneys will know of, of companies that are, um, you know, potential candidates. Yeah. yeah. So even if it starts with a general conversation to the you know the security lawyers and say, look, I would like to start an active campaign where I take a list of lawyers and I give them a call and I say, hey, I want to I want to, you know, give you a brief presentation about what this is. 
right? I think that makes a lot of sense. Right. And then, and then what we'll do is we'll. This is something that we don't want the lawyers to endorse it. That's not ethical, right? We understand that, but but there's but there's an ideal place to get in touch with people who are at the right stage, you know, for that. So they they they, they there's going to be some attorneys who um, um, you know have enough business the traditional way or, or traditional thinking are not going to be that interested. But there's going to be the others that um, you know, are looking to carve out some unique mm. space, okay. and they see the the opportunities to uh, provide public investors with a better deal uh, than they get and yet benefit the entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, it, it's, everybody wants to, you know, I was talking to somebody the other week and I, it was about social change. And I said, I'd come to believe that it's sort of a three-step process. One is you want to place yourself where things are happening. The second step, which is the toughest one, is to recognize you're there. The third step is to start to take steps that you know, actually implement, you know, t- take, build on the opportunity that you have. But so often, um, uh, uh, you know, we may be somewhere where things are happening, but we don't fully realize that we're there. I know I've been guilty of that in the past. Um, I, I think, you know, we both realize that this is a good time. And, and now it's that third step that's called for to, to uh, and, and it's going to be true for the securities attorneys too. You know, they're, they're going to realize that uh, having, expertise and a reputation for being able to help a company shape a fair share model offering um, that you know, they, they can then work with, say, if there's an investment bank, a broker dealer that's involved in, in, in selling it, and they have confident um, confidence in the, the elements that go into it um, uh, and you know, understanding how to work with exchanges. You know, if, 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 if a company raises just $5 million in a uh, offering, whether it doesn't matter how it's constructed, it's not gonna have the same uh, appeal for an exchange as one that raised 20 million or 40 million. Um, so there's, there's a number of parties that, need to, to sort of understand how this would work in their world because ultimately that's what entrepreneurs want is they want to know, okay, if I take this step, am I going to have a relatively smooth road or does the road only go a <laughs> hundred yards? Okay. So what if, what if, um, what if we, what if we detailed out like a PR package, that would be pretty cool. Right. I mean, but unfortunately I, I, I it's a- with an attorney. Uh, and get and let um, let them provide some guidance. What what do they think? Because they're, they're going to be, you know, in baseball uh, analogy, it's a catcher um, having an eye on on the field of of play and 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 sensing what you know pitches need to be made. Um, that that's the right place to start. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I'm actually thinking that it kind of a, a, an opening qualifier, you know, how you only get kind of an elevator pitch mm-hmm. is that there there's a, a real immediate benefit for companies that have upside social potential that they want to leverage so that the words fairness model actually can be leveraged for, um, you know, in the eyes of a public company. They, they they have to buy in. There's value if they see there's value in having a good reputation, then the fair share model is something that they want to look at. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, I, and I tell them, I say that's only the way to parse it. It doesn't mean that another company can't do it that way. It's just that for us, the ideal entrepreneur is the one that's sitting in the lawyer's office tomorrow or next week that has 
that that fills that checkbox. And, and ultimately, the, the 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 question between a conventional capital structure and a fair share model structure mm-hmm. boils down to timing. Mm. When do investors pay for future performance? Conventional model, they pay up front when they invest. Fair share model, they pay once it's delivered. The pain in either case, but um, it's just a matter of when. Right, 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 right. Okay, so I mean, we raise a hundred million dollars, right? Um, and you know, so we effectively get to have the agreements that we've got a hundred million dollars uh, raised. But unfortunately, um, like not all, we need some working capital to get. You well, know, I, I, I think the other thing to 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 explore is going to be. Uh, investors who are interested, there's an opportunity for a brokerage, broker dealer here, right? To to become an online platform because if if if, if they if um you know I'll go one better one than I'll go one they're going to want to use the platform and and if um. You know, a broker dealer can can help sell one. They want to sell sell twenty. I got a better. I got to one up you on this. I'm, I'm thinking I am. So you tell me honestly if I'm on the right track. The broker dealer is not who we want to involve. We're talking to the lawyers itself. Okay, so I don't know if a securities lawyer is the best one, but whoever's representing the entrepreneur, I suppose, or no, uh, there's going to be a lawyer that can be an intermediate that would allow them to have their. Um, you know the bank accounts that they use the uh, escrow accounts. Escrow bank accounts. Would this not uh, be? That, that's that's the, not a big deal. Oh, okay. um, the, the the big deal is um, securities attorney because they can help the uh, you know, identify how to structure and 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 explain the the deal to any anybody who's going to hear it. It's going to be investors, it's going to be regulators, it's going to be exchanges, it's going to be the investor. It, 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 they're, they're the ideal central point. Okay. But companies need, to, once they have an offering, they need to sell it. Now, um, and, and, and 99% of the investors who might have interest the company doesn't know. It's just sort of like trying to sell a piece of real estate without on your own, you know, for sale by owner. Um, you may have the house that's looking great and the like, but people, you're not generating the traffic. Um, uh, and and broker dealers can help with that. Um, and and the bigger the offering, the the, the more a need to to have that type of of support system. So. This isn't um, you know. You, whenever you come up with a new idea, you you you, you have to think about well, who who's going to like it? Who's not going to like it? Whose interests are going to get possibly gored? <laughs> yeah. uh, but things are changing a lot. I mean, we we saw um, just a week or so ago. Some big institutional funds um, cause uh, leadership changes, board level changes at uh, major oil companies, right? Because they they the the sensing things are, are changing. There's a huge opportunity for you know a, a broker dealer to carve out this space. It's sort of like saying. You know, we're in a world of, of retail stores, of shopping malls, and now the Fisher model represents a concept that's akin to outlet stores. <laughs> you know, and so, so the traditionalist might say, well, why would I want to offer my brand name at a, at a discounted price? That's yeah. going to tarnish it. You know, that's, that's going to undermine something. Well, um, we can see in retail it's happened. And some companies figured out how to be in the department stores and the outlet stores. Um, and that challenge 
um, of pivoting and, 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 and reshaping happens in a lot of industries. It's, it's certainly going to be happening in, in the broker-dealer business. Yeah. So you just need somebody who, who, who sees that potential um, and, and they could become, you know, a, a leading platform for these types of offerings. That mm. would be a pretty good thing. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. wouldn't be the only thing that they sell, but, um, you know, they, they'd have, yeah. It, 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 it's a big system, but I think those two places, uh, structuring the offering and selling the offering are, yeah. the, are, are, are important touch points. Yeah, I agree. Well, Carl, I think this pretty much takes us to, I think we went over our time, but. Yeah, I think so too. I think this is a great for second episode. And um, I know we get busy with our time, right? We quite often could, we could, you know, get back to our routines and then I'm giving you a call next month and we're doing another episode. Um, if we're serious about doing something like this, we either need to, you know, schedule something or we need to have some sort of actionable steps. And I think one of the things is to approach the lawyers with the, um, with the idea of making a presentation, right? So, you know, let's take this offline. Um, I've got another 10 minutes and then we'll maybe make a couple actionable steps and see, you know, see what we can do. And ever, to everybody else, we'll tune in next month and we'll see how the progress goes. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.